1993 been teaching EAP at Bilkent University, mainly with the Faculty of Academic English program. He is also part of the Bilkent Educational Technology Support Group, or BETS, which provides Moodle services for the university and training in Moodle and other educational software. In addition to teaching, he occasionally does translation, editing, and television work. He has written on a variety of subjects, including linguistics, education, philosophy, and games. Let's give Robin a very warm uh, welcome. I think I better close the book because it's obscuring my Okay, first of all, um, how many people here regularly try games? Put your hand up if you play any kind of game. Football, poker, computer games, mobile games, everybody almost. Good. Uh, now put your hand up if you play computer games. Uh, slightly more than half. Put your hand up if you play online role playing games. Only a couple. Okay. I'm just asking this so I, I know like, where to pitch it so people aren't going like, to tell us what we already know. Okay. Um, the topic is a bit odd because we tend to think of games and testing at opposite ends of the educational spectrum. So we have like playing hangman in the class here and whole fool somewhere out in the corridor there. They're seen almost as opposites. Um, and my view is that actually they aren't as diametrically opposite as they seem. And I'm going to try and challenge this view of both games and of testing. Uh, first, I'd like to talk a bit about what I'm not going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about game-based learning. I'm not, for example, going to suggest that we test students by having them go on a quest in World of Warcraft, or maybe build something in Minecraft. Um, that would be awesome, and some people haven't really done it, but it's not what I'm interested in today. I'm also not going to talk much about gamification as the word is commonly used, the kind of like points about is leaderboards, although there will be a little bit of overlap. What I'm really interested in is what game designers call gameful design. In other words, you approach something that isn't a game, but in the same way that you would design a game. So you take the general principles of games and see what you can learn from them and apply them to other things. And in this case, of course, the thing we're doing to is testing. Um, I actually <coughs> think that games are superb testing devices. In fact, it's testing that kind of make a game a game. Um, the French sociologist Roger Calois uh, categorized different types of play. Um, one of them is what he calls agon. And he describes this as play through competitive testing. The aim of the game is to test the relative abilities of the contestants, like you see with these two chess players here. Um, I think that's quite a nice place to start. But of course, we do need a definition of the game. Um, Wittgenstein famously said that it was impossible. There is nothing that all games have in common. Um, I think he's right technically, but I have a definition which I find works for most games. Chess, football, Pac-Man. Uh, it doesn't work for kind of peripheral games like gladiatorial games or games of game theory, but that's not what we're interested in here anyway. It doesn't matter. So this is my definition of game. A game is a structured activity designed to facilitate play. So in fact, what is really important here is play. Um, it's play that makes games appealing. And a good example is how you could be play, doing a game but not playing. Um, some of, particularly the male members of the audience, the male British members of the audience, may have memories of being forced to run around half naked in a muddy field in January doing some game-like activity that we didn't really feel we were playing. So in a way, it's like it's outwardly a game, but it's not really gameful. It's not playful. 
Okay. Um, play is even harder to define in games, but we all do have an intuitive sense. I don't know if you can see this. <laughs> Why is that little pussycat? <laughs> yeah. It's hard to see that light gray and gray background, but that is a cute little kitten. Yeah. Okay, so we know that this kitten is fine. We don't need to be told it's fine. But I want to look at some of the particular characteristics of play that make play very useful in education, in learning and also in testing. Firstly, play is something that's done for its own sake. Not exclusively for its own sake. You can play a sport professionally, or you can play a sport to lose weight. But if you are thinking about the money you're making or the calories you are burning when you're playing, then you're not really playing, or you're certainly playing badly. Yeah? Your mind is in two different places at the same time. So the play part of any game is done for its own sake. It has no other purpose. Um, second is um, kind of contradicting this. Uh, it's done for its own sake, but there is sometimes some kind of a price. Um, and this seems to contradict what I've just said. If games are intrinsically motivated, they're done for its own sake, why do they so often have prizes which are extrinsic motivations? I would suggest that prizes provide an impetus to play so long as their in-game value is greater than their out-of-game value. Okay. Now, this is probably a pretty expensive piece of hardware, but its out-of-game value is nothing compared to the significance it has in the game. Um, similarly, um, I sometimes give chocolates as a price when I'm playing a game in class, and my students love this. Um, despite the fact that you know, Bill Kent's students aren't poor, they can go down to the shop, they can buy as many chocolates as they want, anytime they want. It's the fact that it's a price. It's a fact that it signifies that we want the game that is important. Now, titles are similar. Um, you may have noticed on the program that I describe myself as was a level 39 warrior. Um, this is not true, actually. I'm now level 43 since I've done that. This is in a game called Habitica. It's me up on the left, and my buddies on the right. Um, the point of this is that game titles are often intensely coveted, even though they don't translate to anything in the real world. Um, I can't go for a job interview at uh, I don't know, Lancaster University and say, like, you should hire me, I'm a level 43 warrior. It doesn't work. <laughs> but it counts for something. Um, I'm not actually a higher rank than these guys there. It makes me feel good. Um, and things, competition can actually get um, very emotional, very vicious, uh, even, uh, for these titles. But the whole point is that it's... It basically, it's a way of saying that you've won, that you're good at something. Um, what this means in exams um, is ideally what we want is for a student to want to get an A, not because it means they're going to get a certificate that they need for their job or they're trying to improve their GPA average. It's because an A is an epic win, which we'll see more later. Second feature is meaning. He said, games create their own meaning, or play creates its own meaning. Um, think of all, all the things we do in balls in games. Yeah? Um, we throw them, we hit them with rackets or with sticks, we kick them, we throw them through hoops, we throw them into nets, and so on. None of these has any meaning or significance outside the game. It's completely restricted to the game. But it's intensely meaningful in the game. Uh, I once counted a student who, in class, claimed that men were naturally less emotional than women by saying, Have you ever been to a football match? <laughs> the things that they, these guys were doing, what we're failing to do with the ball, have no meaning outside the game. But they're intensely meaningful inside the game. 
Similarly, in an online game like World of Warcraft, you don't see people kind of sitting around depressed saying that, yeah, but you know, what does it all mean? Why do we have to go and kill these <laughs> orcs just to get gold? What is it all for? No. The game generates its own meaning. Um, and again, I think the more you can make your tests meaningful in terms of what you're doing inside the class, then the more it becomes playful. Okay. And the final thing, play is actively absorbing. So lots of things can be absorbing. Entertainment is absorbing. Watching TV is absorbing. Reading a book is absorbing. But it's passive. You can react to a text, but despite what some educators say, you can't interact with a text. Whatever you do to the text, it will not do anything back to you. Um, but with games, you do something, it does something back. And that leads to some interesting psychological states. Um, the most famous one is called Flog. Um, you may have heard of this guy with the unspellable and largely unpronounceable yeah, name. Bravo! <laughs> <laughs> uh, I actually had to find an audio file of that to make sure I got it right. And whenever I'm writing, I always just kind of like Google it and then copy and paste it. Um, the reason is that he's from Gary, by the way. Um, so he's famous with the theory of flow. Flow is a highly enjoyable state of intense concentration on a challenging task. And it has a lot of features like being oblivious to the outside world, losing self-consciousness, um, distortion of time, for example, hours pass like minutes or vice versa. Uh, and he's talking in his book mainly about things like rock climbing, uh, ballet dancing, performing open heart surgery, which apparently surgeons love. They, he interviewed some surgeons and said, I would do this job even if they didn't pay me for it. Which kind of makes me worry a bit about surgeons. I just love cutting people up. Um, but what he said is that play is the flow experience by excellence. Games are designed to increase flow. Um, so, Jamie Goddard, who is a kind of game design goddess, you may have seen her at talks, um, she says that through this flow experience and this participation in games, what we get is a state of participation where we are self-motivated and self-directed, intensely interested and genuinely enthusiastic. Just like our students are when they're in the exam. Um, ironically, actually, when I was explaining flow in my course on games, um, I asked students to think, oh, what are the times that you've had these characteristics of flow, like intense concentration, time, and so on. And one of the students said, like, in an exam, and I said, yeah, you're kidding. And I said, yeah, it's got all of those. It's got intense concentration, it's got obliviousness to the outside world, and particularly it's got distortion of time. It just doesn't have enjoyment. So exams are kind of anti-flow. So these, this is why games are useful in education in general, in terms of learning, particularly in terms of motivation. Uh, my previous talk, some of you may have seen this, it was done here about four years ago, uh, was about called the gamification of the AP. But moving on more particularly to testing, um, aside from motivation, what are the characteristics of games that make them good at testing? And how can we possibly imitate this? So, the first is the inseparability of rules and ends. Um, this comes from um, a guy called Bernard Seuss. Uh, he famously defined games as the voluntary acceptance of unnecessary obstacles. And he also talks a lot about the selection of inefficient means. Um, this makes games different from exams because exams are the involuntary acceptance of unnecessary obstacles. Um, the example that's always used is golf. Okay, so if my aim is to get a ball into a hole in the ground, then I would take the ball and put it into the hole in the ground. What I would not do is walk along away from the ball, take a stick, and try and hit the ball into the hole with the stick. This is the example that you'll find in 
loads of books and websites about game design. What people forget, though, is what comes after it. Um, in Suits' book, uh, they get the grasshopper of games like in Utopia. He goes on to say, and I quote, The end in golf is not correctly described as getting the ball into a hole in the ground. It is to achieve that end with the smallest possible number of strokes. But strokes are certain types of swings with a golf club. Thus, if my end were simply to get a ball into a number of holes in the ground, I would not be likely to use a golf club in order to achieve it, nor would I stand at a considerable distance from each hole. But if my end were to get a ball into some holes with a golf club while standing at a considerable distance from each hole, why then I would certainly use a golf club and I would certainly take up such positions. Okay. So this is what you mean by the inseparability of rules and ends. So what we need to do then um, is consider how the rules and the goals of games interrelate. You can break game rules, but if you do it, then you're not really playing the game anymore. For example, in football, if you pick up the ball with your hands and won't run with it, you're not playing football anymore. But rumor has it that this is how the game of rugby was actually invented. Okay. Um, so the other thing that it means is that the way the game is scored is ideally the same as the way the game is played. Tennis, again, is a good example here. Think of how you score in tennis. Yeah. What they're basically doing is counting the number of times that you get the ball into your opponent's court. So the rule of tennis and the way that tennis is scored and the aim of tennis form this kind of seamless whole. It would be really silly to imagine a game of tennis where after the game is over, the judges like sit around and decide who won. It's like, okay, you know, this guy got more points that I really <coughs> didn't like his backswing. You know, I, I think we should let you know, the other guy win. Uh, that would be crazy. There are some sports where judges do sit around and need to talk about points and so on. Um, ice skating, for example, or gymnastics. But these tend to be like the less game-like sports. Um, now, the reason why I mention this is that this is the opposite to what we do with grading criteria. So, the students write some essay, and what do we do? After they finish it, we're there with our little checky boxes, um, saying, that, oh yes, it's got B plus in this, C minus in that, and so on. And then we come to a conclusion. Now, to a certain extent, we have to do this, because unfortunately, writing an essay is not really like playing tennis. It's more like a boxing match, where sometimes you know, the umpires have to sit around after the game and argue about how many punches the guy got hit, and then eventually the guy's hand up. However, you still wouldn't get a boxing match uh, where one of the guys knocked out his opponent, but the umpire says, well, you know, I don't really think he won because he didn't have good style. I wouldn't have. He won, obviously. Um, how does this apply to essays? Well, um, we have to use criteria. Um, teachers like criteria um, because it makes our life easier. Testers love criteria because they're things you can control, you can research, you can publish papers about them. Managers also love criteria because if you make all your teachers use the same criteria, you can pretend that they're standardized and they're all great and fairly. Um, but, as I said, it's, it should be secondary. Again, think about the case with the knockout. Um, don't, by the way, take a photograph of this thinking this is criteria that we use. It's a very, very old criteria. I don't even remember who put it. So, my current grading criteria. Um, but yeah, think about the the boxer and the knockout. Um, I once had an experience when, after an exam, um, I looked at the grades some of my students had been given by the second marker, and I thought, this doesn't make sense. This is a really, really good essay. So 
I went and I asked for it to be regraded. And the answer I got was, well, actually, yeah, this is a really good essay, but we can't improve the grade because it scores really badly on the criteria. So the moral of this, I think, is that occasionally you need to throw the criteria out of the window. As I said, the best way to test something is where the testing and the playing or the performance are exactly the same thing, like the game of tennis. The second best is the way, it's actually the way we uh, test really important things, like flying a plane or doing open heart surgery. You have the candidate go through and actually do the thing in the company of somebody who is an expert on that. Um, the closest thing we have to that, to that in testing language is I suppose kind of like interview exams. Yeah? So I do an interview with a student, and after that, I think, how well did they do an interview? Criteria are way down with us. All those little ticky checky boxes. They're a way to help us think about it, but they should not dominate our assessment of the students. If it's a good piece of writing, it's a good piece of writing. Uh, similarly, we often put the wrong things in the criteria. Um, if the important thing is whether they won the game, whether they knock the ball over the net more than their opponent, or the box are not in the permanent match, uh, then you need to think, what is the equivalent of that in, say, writing an academic essay? So you think, okay, is this a good academic essay? Not, does every paragraph have a topic sentence? Again, I have a little story about this. Um, I once had a big argument in a standardization session. Um, we're very conscientious about standardization in the um, We regularly kind of share essays. We say, you know, how many marks would you get for this? I think it's a great idea, even though it's a lot of work, uh, but it can result in a lot of arguments. And in this case, I wanted to give this paper a good grade. And one of the teachers was horrified. He said, but some of the paragraphs don't even have a topic sentence. Um, I was kind of like, head desky here. Because topic sentences are a means, not a net. They're a good thing to teach students. Right? Yeah. Show them how to do a topic sentence, uh, get them to practice it in class. Um, but you shouldn't be going through each paragraph, mm, where's the topic sentence in this paragraph? Because it's not a criterion for writing an excellent essay. It's something that good essays often have. Um, incidentally, I read a nice paper about uh, paragraphing and topic sentences. Um, the guy took uh, an article from a newspaper, put all the paragraphs together into one big block, asked his students to put in the paragraph, right? His students were Ethel, potential Ethel teachers. They could not find the paragraphs. And this was a respectable newspaper. So. Um, I think what we're doing, if we start grading things like topic sentences, um, or you know, the fine details of PowerPoint, then we are confusing the role of coach and umpire. An umpire, sorry, a coach may say to a player, you really need to improve your backswing. That's the equivalent of teaching topic sentences. The umpire should not disqualify a player because she has a lousy backswing if she can still get the ball over the court. Okay. Um, again, um, speaking of tennis, uh, another thing that games do really well is provide constant feedback. Uh, this relates very much to, I don't know if any of you were in the one this morning about uh, frequent testing. Um, it's been shown repeatedly that the best way for students to learn is through frequent low stakes testing. Um, also, you need a very, very quick feedback cycle. Games do this brilliantly. So here we have the scores coming up in tennis. Even if there wasn't a scoreboard, this guy, he still knows when he's scoring a point because he can see the ball landing his, his opponent's court. He may need to like check the, the maths occasionally, but yeah, he's got an immediate feedback on how well he's doing. It would be wonderful if writing essays were like this. If you imagine like the students writing an essay and their points for like language and organization and style, like, go up and down like health plans on a computer game. Um, that would be great, but it's also impossible. The problem we have 
is that feedback cycles are very long, often. Um, I don't know about you guys, it, it takes me about two weeks to get feedback to all my students after they write an essay. Particularly because my field is EAP, some of our essays are like 1,000 words, 2,000 words. Um, so by the time you've got through 60 of those, you're not only brain dead, it's two weeks in past. Uh, and I don't see a way around that, unfortunately. I've, I've tried various methods to improve my marking time, I'm using kind of online grading and this and that. It still takes forever. Um, what we can do, though, is automate kind of big, high stakes things like essays with kind of little itty bitty things. Um, or even like um, some fairly high stakes things that are still easy to break uh, quickly. For example, all presentations. Um, I do my best to get feedback to my students after an all presentation within a day. I mean, nearly within a day. Um, and if you don't, then you know, what is the point of telling somebody in their feedback on their oral presentation that you know, I, it was a, a bit rushed towards the end. They don't remember the presentation they gave two weeks ago. So rapid feedback is important. And of course, the, the perfect thing for that um, is an online quiz. Because as soon as they finished it, bang, they can see their score. Um, there's also a thing uh, that again, online quizzes are getting very, very close to being games. Um, I was recently looking at a, an online course on game design, uh, and the syllabus is like, hey, there we want quiz, and then in parentheses, a quiz is like a short, lame game. Okay? Mm -hmm. And sometimes even though they're not that late. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard of a program called Quizique. Uh, it provides quizzes in French. I'm trying to learn French at the moment. And um, you can go in, you can take a quiz on your French level. Um, and if you do have the free version, you get, I think, one quiz a month. If you upgrade to the paid version, you can have as many quizzes as you want. And presumably, some people are paying for this. They are actually paying to do quizzes. And God, fuck our students will like this. It's wonderful. Um, so, but of course, the thing is, they can see, again, it's like you, inseparability of rules and me and ends. They can see that they're doing this quiz is part of their end in learning French. They know that it's helping them to learn French just by doing the quiz. They don't care so much about the brain. Hey, uh, another thing, um, invest, investment in loss. Um, this is Jim Anching. Uh, he was my Taiji's, Taiji teacher's, teacher's teacher. Um, and as an old man in Taiwan, he was known as being invincible. As a young man in mainland China, he was known as the kid who was always getting beaten up. Because his way to improve his technique was to challenge the best Tai Chi players and Kung Fu fighters that he could find. Um, like in mainland China in those days, challenges were, were very, very rough. Um, so he would go, and they would like kick him around a bit, and they'd think, well, yeah, what, what was I doing wrong? What was he doing right? Um, and this kind of failure is not an option, it is essential. Um, and again, it's ties in with what people are doing in games. Uh, James Moynihan, who we saw earlier, uh, wrote that um, in 80% of cases, four cases out of five, he says, gamers don't complete the mission, run out of time, don't solve the puzzle, lose the fight, fail to improve their score, crash and burn, or die. This is all my games. We're talking about their characters dying. We're talking about their actual death here. Or in other words, if you took a snapshot of an online game like World of Warcraft, 80% yeah, of the people would be paid. Okay, let's think about how that would work out in our own exams. Uh, dismal. Um, if you want to keep your job, you do not want a 20% pass rate. Um, so does this mean the game is too difficult? No. Um, game designers are very aware of this kind of balance of challenges and skills. 
It's one of the main factors in flow. And if a phenomenally, phenomenally successful game like World of Warcraft has people failing 80% of everything they do, then 80% is probably the correct ratio of failure to success. Um, what we need to do is to work out ways to test students so that they can fail. Okay? It's not so much we need to fail safe, the safe ways to fail, which means that obviously not everything we do should be graded. Um, in fact, we do this all the time. Um, every time you ask a student a question in a class, I say, you know, um, I share what's the difference between second condition and third condition. Um, I'm testing that, I'm testing that much. I'm not giving any grades. Um, I mentioned playing games in class right at the beginning. Um, although I said I'm not going to be talking about game based learning here, I do play a lot of games in class. And again, every time you play a game, it's like a test. Um, I don't know if any of you have used that online tool, Socrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Um, um, it's a great way to do online quizzes. And they have a thing called a space race. You can divide the students into teams and little spaceships go across, and, and they love it. Um, and this is, in a way, a very good combination of game playing and testing. Um, okay, so we need safe ways to fail. Um, another way we can do this. Uh, yeah. um, I have some quizzes that I put on Moodle. Um, you can kind of see some quiz results up at the right. You know, the three highest grades, all at 100% there, all the one guys. Um, by the way, that is the. Um, in case any Harry Potter fans are wondering about this. These are the teams that I use for, for games and group activities in class. So they have a score there. The point is that neither of these scores mean, mean very much. Um, this is purely um, for the honor of getting the highest points for your house. Um, actually, when I was alive, we, we actually had houses in schools. And uh, we had house points in competition. Um, again, there was, there was no actual benefit to our grades, but we did it for our house. Um, the ones on the right, um, these are the camera quizzes that I put on Moodle. And the students, um, they do the quizzes and they get graded not on, um, rather than this kind of like traditional adventure game where in order to get from X to Z, you have to go through Y. You know, if you want to find the crown of Grey Bear, you have to pass through the Shadowlands and find the purple mage who will give you the crystal to find 